Amen. Good morning. These girls. I'm glad, I'm glad they made it on stage. I'm glad she made it on stage. I mean, I'm, I'm over here worshiping, watching her. Man, if, if anybody else was in here le- le- worshiping like that, <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about you. <laughs> Woo, man, that was some good stuff. That was some good stuff. Uh, I, was worship, I was worshiping, watching her worship, and then she's pointing over to me when I'm lifting my hands, I'm back at you, you know, so that was good. That was good, good stuff, man. Woo, man. All right, so I, I'm, I'm distracted. All right. Good morning again. Glad to have everybody with us today as we get together. You know, I've been reading in uh, Exodus in my own private time, just me and God talking and reading Exodus. And, and right now, it's the time where they're building the, the tabernacle. And uh, that's a couple of thousand years, less than a couple of thousand years before Jesus shows up on the scene. And where we're at in John chapter 8 right now. And, and so Jesus shows up, and he is the tabernacle. I don't know if you know that. I mean, that's what John says in the first chapter. He says that he tabernacled among us. So, so the, in Exodus, they're building this tabernacle, which is to point to the tabernacle, Jesus coming to us. It's, it's so awesome. And some of the stuff we'll talk about this morning is, is that you see all these pictures from the Old Testament are pointing to Jesus. So when he shows up in living color, they were supposed to be able to get it. They were supposed to go, oh, I see, I get it. He, this is God with us. The name, Emmanuel, God with us. All of these things were so the people got it. So they go, oh, I see. You know, and, and so we, we gather today to worship this Jesus and to make him known. He wants to be known. But we come together, we come together to worship him uh, as people that follow him and then people maybe that are still in search. And I say to all of you this morning, welcome. We're glad to have you with us today. Let's pray. Uh, We love you this morning, God. We thank you, God, for this great opportunity to come and just bring your word. Lord, I pray that we parse it out uh, to people grasp it, understand, Lord, just Jesus as you came in living color and, and wanted people to know you. And I pray, God, if there's anyone that does not know you today, I pray for their salvation. Uh, pray for folks who are just going through stuff and just glad to be around you and your people, God. I, I pray for love and comfort and strength. Uh, I pray that you would meet with us this morning, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, yeah, welcome. Uh, if you're here with us first time or been a few times just visiting with us, uh, we're glad to have you with us. We are in the Gospel of John. We're kind of like... Not right in the middle of it, but we're in the thick of things in John uh, chapter 8. So we, we pick up, we pick back up at the temple where Jesus is outing himself in plain sight. He's letting the world know that he is the Messiah. He is saying it plain enough by pointing them to the scriptures, the scriptures that we can read. He's pointing out so that they can see him in the scriptures. Jesus is trying to get them to match what they are seeing and hearing in him with the scriptures. It's the same today. The, the, God says, you're going you're gonna to find me in my work. You know? And that's what God expects for us to do. And the response, the response so far, though, it says that some are believing, some are questioning it, and then some want to kill Jesus. Today, it's the same responses, right? Some people believe. Uh, some people question it. And there's, well, if they could get to him, they want to kill him. But they, some just hate him. So we pick up in John chapter 8 where there is a parenthetical story inserted in your Bibles. Actually, uh, begins with chapter 7, verse 53. It's the story of the woman caught in adultery. And the most Bible students are familiar with the story. We see in the story every characteristic of Jesus that is immersed throughout the Gospels. We witness his compassion for the woman, his forgiveness for the woman, and then he follows that with go and sin no more. However, the majority of scholars believe the story, while likely true, It was inserted years later. It's not in the oldest manuscripts. Nothing about the story changes the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but it's an awkward interruption to Jesus back and forth 
uh, between the Jews. So for our purposes this morning, we're going to get back to the interaction Jesus was having with the Jews at the temple. So we'll go back to the scene where these folks were witnessing all week at the temple and the symbolism that Jesus was using to tie everything into a perfect little bow so they could see that indeed he was the Messiah. We ended last week with how Christ shared that he was the living water in so many words and that when, that, when, when they ran dry, that is spiritual empty, he was enough. Jesus is enough. If you're spiritually empty, if you realize that, Jesus is enough. He is the water from the rock. And he would make those who believed in him overflow as rivers reaching and fulfilling others through the Holy Spirit to come. So in this chapter, Jesus continues with the pictures. And they were more than pictures. They were more, more than just symbolic. All of these things, these, these feasts, all of these details relating to them were about Jesus. You know, it's one thing when you're, you know, Jesus is preaching and teaching all the time and, and he'll see a rock and he'll use that as an illustration. He'll, he'll see some grass over here or the, the sea and he'll use those illustrations. But in the Old Testament, Jesus, it's all, all of those illustrations are about Jesus. And that's what he's, and, and, and that was the Father's great plan so that when we read that and when we see him, we go, oh, that's him. And that's what we're seeing. So these weren't just good, good illustrations. God had longed for this day. It was the reason God's pictures from back in the day were so important. He knew that when he sent the son, they would need these pictures to understand who he was. You see, God wants you to know that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that he has come to save you from your sins. He was the bread in the wilderness. He was the living water. And we'll learn today, he is the light of the world. And at that same feast, the Jews performed another ceremony where they lit four huge candelabras in the court of the women in the temple, observing the fact that the Lord had been a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night to protect and guide Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. That cloud appeared on the day when Israel left Egypt standing as a barrier between uh, them and Pharaoh's armies on the night before they crossed the Red Sea. Then as it went with them in the wilderness, it was the perfect visual depicting the, the Lord God with his people. So in the same courtyard where the torches were lit, Jesus unabashedly proclaimed in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. You see the scene? The light they're seeing in the temple, these lights, these, can these lights lighting up, and Jesus in that place says, I am the light of the world. While they're thinking about light, he tells them that I am the light of the world. This is a big hawking deal. these great torches in the background in a very emotional and spiritual week, Jesus announces that he is the light of the world. This was about him. These magnificent torches represented the Shekinah glory of God. And that's speaking of the heaviness, the heaviness of God, the glory of God coming down. And if, if they were understanding in this very moment, the manifest presence of the living God was standing before them in Jesus Christ. What a moment this was. I'm not making a big enough deal out of it. I'm trying, but that just this moment. The glory of God was right there. That's what he was saying. Or he's the craziest person that ever came on the planet. His words are life or death. To those who believe him, his words are life. To those who reject him, his life or death. And these words that he states contribute to his own death because he's standing fast and this is who he is because that's who he is. And to those that don't believe in him, it's death because oh, they're planning to kill him. He's making statements that are blasphemous if it was anybody else saying it. 
Jesus was leaving no middle ground, no guesswork on who he was saying he was. Jesus is either who he claimed to be or a liar. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that because every religion in the world besides Christianity does say good things about Jesus. Some call him a prophet. Some he's a teacher. Some he's a good person. Some no. He's either who he said he is or he's a liar. He's not, every other religion has him less than deity, less than being God. I'm saying again, he is God or not. And, and that's what he said. He's not, he's not leaving room. See, Jesus is God, but he had to mask his glory so that he could dwell among us so he took on human form. Paul wrote, Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 6 through 8, speaking of Jesus, he said, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus emptied himself of his glory, so to speak, so that men could be in his presence. For the scripture says, no man can see God face to face and live. So he couldn't come in all of his glory. Nobody could even come around him. And, and on that special day recorded in Matthew chapter 17, you may know that as the Mount of Transfiguration story where uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mount with them and they get to see the radiance of his glory. They literally says his, his face lights up. He, he shines. So they got, a, they got a glimpse of his glory in a unique setting. And he told them, right, if you remember that, he told them, uh, don't tell anybody else about this until, you know, things happen. You see, God does want to be known, so he tells them, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. The use of I am signifies that Jesus is claiming his deity. He said that he, said that he was the light, not a light. He said he was the light, the one and only light to give spiritual enlightenment to the spiritually dark world. Again, John is making it clear in his gospel that Jesus is making it clear that he is God. Who is Jesus? He's God. That's what he's saying. I, I, want, I want to try. I want to try as, as best I can. I want to, us to put ourselves in their shoes as best as we can. So, so think about this. They, the Jewish people, they were a people, they were looking for the Messiah. Okay, back in there, let's go get there, get our sandals on, our you know, clothes they wore, and, and it's dusty and all that. Uh, well, I don't think, always think of it being dusty there, but yeah. It's, uh, but, but it is, and, and so we're, let's just get there in our minds. They're, they're people looking for the Messiah. They're desperate. They're under Roman rule. They can't stand that, and they, they had, they had, but they had scriptures that pointed to him and his coming. They had, they had the book. They had the scrolls, and then they had these feasts and they had tabernacles and all kind of stuff that was pointing to him. In fact, that's what he's been doing the last couple of weeks when we talked about these scenes. He's trying to get them to reflect back during Moses' days and things that were pointing to him. He's trying to help them connect the dots. So they're looking at all this. And, and, and so, you know, and then so this guy named Jesus of Nazareth, he shows up on the scene and, but, but, you know, some of them had a problem with him because they knew, they knew him when he grew up, right? They, they knew the house he grew up in. They, they, and so this was, a, this was kind of a stumbling block for some of them. But, now, but now, by now, though, many have now seen the miracles that he's done. They're like, now you're starting to get where I don't care where he's from. I don't care that I knew where he's from. Oh, you see the stuff he's doing? Hey, who else could do that? And then he speaks. When he speaks, he speaks with authority like God's talking. You know, I mean, like, ain't nobody arguing with this guy. So we're like, okay, I know where he grew up at, but this guy, this cat's different. Right? I mean, so the, these are all things they're supposed to know. So, so they come to the Feast of Tabernacles, this week-long celebration that we've been talking about, and they enter Jerusalem with maybe a little more anticipation and expectation than they normally do because there are murmurings about this Jesus. Some are hopeful. 
Some are negative. Some are like, is this just the one? And some are like, they're going to kill him. I mean, it's, it's just like this. It's either he is or he's not, right? Either we follow him or we kill him. I mean, it's, it's one of the two. But there's a lot of something. It's it, something stirred up. It's something is in the air on this date, okay? And so Jesus, he shows up in the middle of the celebration and he starts teaching in the temple and he knows it's time to cut loose. He knows his days are numbered. It's gonna be about six months now till he's on the cross. So uh, the father has sent him and the time for quiet is over. I mean, laying low, it's over. It's time to just come out. Everybody's gotta know. He's just explained that he offers the living water. I mean, wow. And, and that's big, if you remember from last week. I mean, but then he, he follows that with, I'm the light of the world. So he's not mincing his words. This is a declaration of, I am, which is huge. This statement was much more impactful for them in their setting than Russ reading it page to page. You're just reading it and going, uh-huh, and going to chapter nine. I mean, that's, you know. But they, this was like, whoa. He sounds like a narcissist unless he is God. We can only imagine the shock and awe reactions from the Jews and the religious leaders. It's not, it's not been that long since he proclaimed, I am the bread of life. And even more recently, he declared, if anyone's thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, he's always pointing to scripture, by the way. From his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So the same man who had claimed he was the bread of life and was the source of drink to the thirsty now claimed to be the light of the world. Jesus' bold claims demanded a verdict. You just can't sit on the sidelines after all the stuff Jesus said and go, man, he's cool, you know, or no, he's not. I mean, you got to think, what, who, what is he? Who is he? He is either who he said he was or he's the worst imposter to inhabit the planet. So my question to you this morning, who is Jesus to you? Of all the questions in the world, that's the only question you got to get right. Amen. Who is Jesus to you? And by the way, he is the light of the world, not just to the Jews. A future reality for darkness and light are issued. Jesus has come to expose and dispose of darkness. We live in a dark world, don't we? I mean, we, we live in the sad reality of sin. It, it, it has darkened our world. People do dark things. We're tempted to do dark things. Jesus comes to expose our sin, and that's called conviction. Conviction. You read the Bible, and it can hurt your feelings because it tells you to not do that or to do this. So you know what you can do? Not read the Bible. And you know what most people do? They don't read the Bible. Yeah, I mean, Jesus walks in the room. If you're having a good day, you're glad he walked in the room. If you're having a, you know, fleshly day, carnal day, you're not so glad he walked in the room. You feel kind of, you know, you can't look up. It's a dark world. But even more, and this is good, he comes to rid the world of darkness. You see, Jesus is the light of the world, and if you're living in darkness now, it doesn't have to be that way. 
If you're here today, I just said some things that hurt your feelings because you're thinking of your own sin and personal sin. Look, it doesn't have to stay that way. That's why Jesus came. He came. He is full of mercy and grace. All we do is have to come to him and bring what that is and say, God, help me with this. You know I don't want to do this. I don't want to be this way. Help me with this. You know what? He knows because he knows you're made out of dirt. Psalm 103 says that. I'm not just throwing stuff at you, okay? He, he knows what we're made of. And when we go to beat ourselves up, we, we come to him. He says, come to me. Come to me. You see, Jesus is the light of the world, so this lets us know there is hope. You've come in this morning. Things are crappy in life right now. There is hope because of the light of the world. Christ disposes of the darkness on the cross and he brings his followers into the light. He defeated the domain of darkness, Colossians 2.15. He put the enemy to public shame. On the cross, Satan thought he was shaming Jesus but it was the other way around. He, put him to, he made a public spectacle of his enemy. Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. You see, we were, bo we were born, we started out in the domain of darkness. Our house was the domain of darkness. But he has transferred us, God has, to the kingdom of his beloved son, to those who believe in him, in whom we have redemption. He bought back. He bought us back the forgiveness of our sins. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You don't have to stay in darkness. He's called you out of that into his marvelous light. Amen? Come to Jesus. Follow him. Rather, receive his invitation to come, because that is it. It's his invitation to come. Believe in him. And here's the future reality of darkness and light. It is good news for some, bad for others. It depends on which side of the truth you want to be on. But we're going to read some stuff in Matthew. These are Jesus' words. I want you to hear what he has to say in Matthew 8, 12. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So after a centurion had shown great faith, in Jesus, back in Matthew chapter 8, he referred to the Jews that he knew were rejecting him as the sons of the kingdom who will be thrown into outer darkness. Those who do not follow Jesus, the sons of darkness, to be clear, will live outside the light for eternity. And that's heavy stuff, and that's why Jesus came to warn us. Matthew twenty two thirteen. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I, I, again, this is Jesus talking. The unbelievers will be cast on the outside. They will be nowhere near the light. Jesus is the light. There is no darkness in the light. Any of us, all of us know this. If you're in a dark room and just the smallest light in there, you can see it, right? It just, it's because the darkness cannot handle the light. And we live in a dark world. We need Jesus. So there's no darkness in the light. And the darkness exists on the outside. So if you want to be in the darkness, you'll not be in the light. Matthew 25 to 25 verse 30, Jesus said, And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is why you want to be in the light. Those who don't want to follow Jesus 
as king, those who want to serve Satan, who is usually best, descri- uh, uh, best disguised as ourself, rather than serve Jesus, are accounted worthless servants. They will be outside of the light in the outer darkness. Habakkuk 2.14 in the Old Testament says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There is a day coming when the glory of the Lord will, be, will fill the whole earth, and in that day the world will know what we already ought to know, the Lord is God. He is creator. His Shekinah glory, the, the heaviness of God, his Shekinah glory will be impossible to ignore in that day for it's going to cover the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. There's coming a day when everybody's going to know. Ain't going to be no guesswork. Sadly, on these days where Jesus preached hard from the temple for the Jews to come around, we know they dismiss him. Yet, there is a future glory for them. They will come around. Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Even still, a future promise is out there. Even further, it's the ultimate fulfillment. In Revelation 21, verses 23 and 24, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will, be bring, their, will bring their glory into it. The ultimate reality is that the earth does not need the light of the sun. If you've read Genesis chapter 1, you see it says, in the beginning God created the light, right? He said, God said, let there be light. He doesn't create the sun till day 4. God doesn't need the sun. God already had the place lit up. And it will be that way again. See, when the, when the new heaven and the new earth come on the scene and the new Jerusalem descends after the evil is dealt with at the great white throne judgment, God gives light and its, la- and its light and its lamp is the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is the light of the world. The glory of the Lord will light up the new world And we who are in the light will bask in his glory. So, Jesus is the image of the invisible God and the exact radiance of his nature. Hebrews 1.3 and Colossians 1.15. So what? The eternal blessings are for his followers. Whoever follows me, Jesus said, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In the context, in that context, follows. Follows means complete submission to Jesus as Lord. God does not accept a half-hearted following of Christ, of receiving him as Savior, but not following him as Lord. They knew what follow meant. The person who comes to Jesus comes to him on Jesus' terms, not theirs. There is no special deal for you. There is no special deal. I I keep hearing this from people that that tell other people that they got to deal with God. They don't have to go to church because they got to deal with God or they don't have to read the Bible because they got to deal with God or they don't have to, whatever, baloney. Jesus said, we're going to get there. We're not there. We're going through John, but Jesus said there's one way. 
You come his way or you don't come at all. Well, you think if this was such a big deal, then God would come down here himself and say it. He, he did. That's exactly what we're talking about. That's why he did it. And Jesus illustrated this on several occasions, like Matthew 8, 18 through 22, uh, and in Luke 18, 18 through 27. Don't have time to cover those, but he hits hard, particularly with the rich young ruler. As in that story, we see that Jesus was not begging people to come follow him. He wasn't chasing people down. He wasn't trying to convince them. And I think sometimes we as fellow believers, we try to convince people. You ever try to do that? You, try, you got somebody, you don't mean, you, you, you read the Bible. You know what Jesus says happens. You know what it means to be in the outer darkness. And you got people, friends or family that maybe you're here today with them, uh, that, that you want them to come to know Jesus because you want to see them in heaven. And let's be real. You just want to see them again at the end, right? Yeah. And you want to convince them. But let me just go ahead and tell you, you can't. You can't and you're not supposed to. Jesus wasn't trying to convince him. He's just sharing. He was here sharing who he was. All we can do is do what he does, share from scriptures who he is, what he's done for us. But Jesus just, he shares the truth about himself. It's up to them. It's up to you to believe and, and turn and follow Jesus. I mean, in those stories, people would go, well, you know, Jesus, in that, like, Jesus, I'll follow you, but I got to go do this, or I got to go do that. Look, I, you know, I'm talking to people sometimes, they'll tell me why they can't do something. Look, you ain't got to tell me, just say I ain't coming. You know, I, don't need excuses, right? We have reasons, sometimes it's a good reason, that's fine, I, it's fine, I'm, I'm going to accept it, whatever, it doesn't matter. Jesus, doesn't, Jesus is not here to need to hear your or my reason or excuse of why we're not following. Just do or don't. You see, Jesus was not interested in making following him easy. Did you notice that? Is it easy to follow him? Jesus was not interested in making salvation easy for people, but genuine. Right? And this is where we got to be careful in the church of having people pray a prayer and then live like the devil the rest of their life. Following Jesus looks a lot different than being at VBS or somewhere and praying a prayer, or lifting a hand, and not following Jesus the rest of your life. If you did that, you need to check things. See, Jesus wanted their absolute allegiance, obedience, and submission. In Luke 9, 23 to 24, he said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That's not candy cane Christianity. I actually I think there's that version is out there, Right? The candy cane Christianity is going to take a lot of people to hell. It's easy in the sense that Jesus does all the heavy lifting. Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus suffers. Jesus forgives you and me the same old sin. He does the heavy lifting. But it's not easy in that we die to self, right? We, we, we're, we, we, we turn from our sin and turn to follow him. But we always keep looking back, right? You know what happened? Remember what happened to Lot's wife, right? When she looked back. <clears throat> Following Christ is not burdensome as walking in the light illustrates. See, following Jesus is far easier than stumbling around in the dark. And a lot of us are stumbling around in the dark, right? I don't know what to do. How can I do What are the answers to it? I don't know. Follow Jesus. He's the light. So after a bunch of jabber jawing back and forth from verses 13 to 27, they call Jesus a liar, and then he keeps telling the truth, saying things like, you don't know my daddy. Y'all need to read this. I'm, I, I, I don't have time to go back all over it. But, but in this, I mean, Jesus, they're going back and forth. Jesus says, y'all don't know my daddy. He says, you don't know my daddy. And then he also, Jesus, love him. Jesus says, y'all going to die in your sins. 
Now, th- I, mean, I need you to hear me say that. Jesus is talking to these people, and they're going back and forth. He goes, you're going to die in your sins. I mean, if you want, you know, everybody loves Jesus, baby Jesus, and, and fire and eyes, Jesus is coming back next time. But this is it's getting a little taste right here as he says, y'all going to die in your sins. And he even told them, your dad is, your dad is the devil. Now, some of these words are going to get them put on the cross, right? But that's right. He knew he was ready. They question him, and he keeps telling them the truth. Do you see the theme? Jesus tells the truth, and they don't want to hear it. And that's some, um, maybe even here today. You're listening, you're not, you don't want to hear it. Don't really want to hear it. Came for the lunch afterwards. I, I don't know, just... Mostly the argument is about the religious Jews trying really hard not to believe. I need to say that again. Mostly the argument is about the religious Jews trying really hard not to believe. And then Jesus says something that they will have to reflect on at a future date when it happens. Verses 28 to 30, he says, So Jesus said to them, When you, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then, then you will know that I am He, and that I Do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So acknowledging their blatant disbelief, Jesus tells one more harsh truth, and and he uses when and then. He says, when this happens... Then you will know that I am he. When what? When you have lifted up the Son of Man, that is Jesus, then you will know that I am he. See, he's already made that statement once before. He said to Nicodemus the night Nick visited him uh, in John chapter 3, Jesus knew that Nicodemus was struggling to believe. This is where I want to hear this. Nicodemus was struggling to believe. I, I think that Nicodemus wanted to believe. So maybe that's some here today. Maybe you've not believed, but you're like, I need to hear some. I want to believe, okay? So, so if we're struggling to believe, I do believe Jesus gives us what we need to know if we're struggling to believe. But here's the problem. I think it's not far out to think that Jesus knew that they were struggling not to believe. You see, sometimes there's some things we just don't want to believe, right? I, I need y'all to be with me here. So, so, there's this, there's this thing. There's this thing that I really want to believe. Um, and all I need is just a little evidence. You know what? And because I really want to believe it, just give me a little bit of evidence. I'm probably not even going to check the footnotes and check the source, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, there's something that you, because uh, you really want to believe it. But if there's something you don't want to believe, um, you know, you're really trying hard not to believe, right? So I'm going to see, I need some sources, okay? I'm going to check them out because I really don't want to believe this. Do you hear what I'm saying? Uh, Teresa and I are watching uh, that uh, documentary, World War II in Color or something. Is that it? Any of y'all seen that? You know, there was times when I think some of Hitler's commanders were would just say stuff he wanted to hear. And he'd check it out. He just, just okay, that's what I wanted to hear, right? There wasn't no, you know, wasn't none of us be sure about this stuff, you know? I, and I'm reading, the, now we're watching the part in uh, Pearl Harbor. I'm thinking, what were they thinking? They thought we were just going to like, oh, just bomb the place. We'll be okay with that. I mean, who, who, who thought that was a good idea? I'm thinking maybe if somebody's on the fence, I'm thinking you really, Jesus, we're, we're in John chapter eight. Jesus, in John chapter one, I gotta be honest with you, in John chapter one, I've got enough information there that I'm believing. You know what I'm saying? If you're still struggling by John chapter eight, I mean, you just don't wanna believe. All right, well, either way, either way, there, there was a day coming When these events, the crucifixion, the Son of Man lifted up, took place, Jesus 
Jesus wanted, as stubborn as they were, as cruel as they were to him, he wanted them to look back at this prophecy right here, and that's what this was, and wanted them to have a freeze frame moment and see him on the cross high and lifted up and think back to this conversation, perhaps like that moment when Jesus told Peter that he denied him three times in the cock would crow. Uh, for all intent and purposes, Jesus said, Here's what he says, when you see me on the cross, then you will know that I am God. And then I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. He's saying that when you see me up on the cross, of course, he's having to word it in a way because it's a prophecy. But when you see me up there, somebody's going to remember this conversation and know that everything that I've told you up to this point is true. Even though they doubt him, he lets them know that his confidence is in the Father who sent him now and later, and then he's when he is on that cross. After he said this, it says that many believed in him. And I ain't gonna lie, when it says that many believed in him, I don't believe that they believed because why did they let him get killed? D did they really believe? I mean, it's a lot of times it says the disciples believe, and then later on you says now they believe. And then later on it says now they believe. When do they believe? I don't. God knows. That's the thing. God knows when you and I really believe. Many believe intellectually, but as the rest of the chapter shows, their belief was head knowledge, not heart knowledge. You see, faith is more than intellectual assent, James 2.19 tells us that, but is full acknowledgement of the truth revealed about God, a surrender to that truth and a lifestyle flowing from that. Surrender. Real biblical faith obeys. Hebrews 3.18 and 19 says, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. This teaches genuine faith demonstrates that it is real by obedience. See, we know that faith alone saves us. And obedience does not save us. But we also know nobody's perfect. Anybody perfect in here? All right, okay. Look around, okay. However, obedience does demonstrate that our faith is genuine. It's about direction, not perfection. Turning from sin and to Christ. If a person says that he or she believes in Jesus and shows no evidence of obedience to God's word, that person's faith is questionable. Only God truly knows the heart of a person. So I'll end us with this. What would God say about your heart? Would he call you a true believer? You see, I would much rather someone doubt their salvation this morning, right now, and get it right than trust their eternity in a false profession. Are you professors of the kingdom of God or are you possessors of the kingdom of God? That is the question. Do you, did you truly believe? Were you at a thing, you raised your hand, but there's no life change? Did you come for, we had somebody the other day that got baptized second time in about a year because they said, you know, I just did that for some family member the first time. But they've been in the word. They've been searching. And we talked. We had talks about this because I'm like, I think you're right. You know, because we'd had good talks. I hadn't read. I haven't met a person that probably read more of the Bible and books related to the Bible in the past year than this person. And I'm like, okay. All right. You just did it for them. And maybe here. I mean, maybe that's your situation. Look, it's much better to get it right on this side because you can't change it on the other side. I invite you to stand and respond how God has spoken to you this morning. If you're one of Christians, I ask you to pray. If God is speaking to you, make a decision. Don't be thinking about getting out of here. Be thinking about doing business with God. Isn't it awesome that he 
cares enough to speak to us spirit to spirit.